Hello everybody, Carlton Pearson and my wife Gina, and happy Valentine's Day to you. Well, actually, it's tomorrow, Friday, but we wanted to just kind of give you a little bit of a love, reach out and love on you and hug on you and just kind of have a chat tonight about love and something that I posted uh, today and I'll read it in just a second. So say hello to the folks, baby. Hi, it's really great being with you. I know Carlton has been committed to really bringing you a quality experience and I trust that tonight will be the same. This is only the second time Gina has been on the show with me and uh, or the, the live streams and she actually, we got such a huge response when we just kind of at the last minute put it together and just said let's just talk to the people and you, you loved it and there's been thousands of people observing that so anyway let me just read to you what I posted because there seems to be an interest in it, in it and then we'll just have a casual conversation about it okay. Uh, I asked this question because I saw something about pain and love is is powerful and passionate can be very pathetic you remember that song years ago love makes you do foolish things it does and most people who want to fall in love have this fantasy idea about it that it's all sweetness and when you when you get to the real issues that that love is a covenant around uh, they fall apart there's a, like a 67 percent divorce rate in this country we've been married 20 years and that's that's a milestone for a lot of people. My parents will be married 67 years in April, um, just a couple of months. And I always say people ought to get Nobel Peace Prizes when they when they uh, last that long. But let me just read this very short. Why is love often such a painful emotion, especially for women, or is it? Falling in love is giving someone the power to break your heart or to destroy you while trusting they won't. Some of the worst feuds. In the, on the planet happen between families, not only to husband and wife, but sometimes brothers and sisters or siblings after a funeral. Love is passionate, love is painful, love is, is um, powerful. And sorting through it and dancing around it and navigating and negotiating it is an ongoing uh, responsibility. America's abuse of prescription painkillers has reached epidemic proportions, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention. The uh, CDC estimates that 15,000 people die every year in this country from overdoses involving opioid uh, or narcotic pain relievers. And I know most of that is physical, but a lot of it's emotional. People can't sleep. Uh, they're hurting psychologically. They're hurting deep in their soul and they take painkillers to deaden them uh, about. It's not always a headache or something physical. They just want to stop feeling or they desensitize themselves. So that's what I'm, how I'm seeing this. While men are more likely to die from painkiller abuse, the number of deaths among women was up 400% between 1999 and 2010. Mm. Painkiller, the women are dying because of pain. People are painkillers. They're, they're abusing something to deaden the pain that's actually killing them. More women are dying at rates that we have never seen before, said uh, CDC Director Dr. Thomas Fraden. Stopping this epidemic in women and men is everybody's business. That's one of the reasons why I want to talk about it tonight. There's too much pain out there. How can we either remove the pain or adjust it and 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 and, and what you would say, disappear it. How can we get it out of here? Love is precious, painful, pathetic, powerful, and sometimes completely debilitating. Whether agape, that will be God's love, or phileo, that's friendship, brotherly love, or er erotic, um, uh, eros love in Greek, that, that's romantic, passionate sexual love. We still love love, and perhaps we have a love-hate relationship with it. Isn't that amazing? So let's talk about how you maintain a meaningful love relationship and navigate the pathos of love, the, the, the melancholy of love, the low times. Nobody can hurt you like somebody you love or, or somebody who loves you. And you can hurt nobody more painfully than somebody who loves you. So. We have children, our children, there's passion in our love for our children. There's pain involved if you can't provide for them or something like that. And so when you, let's say you love somebody, you're saying you love the part of yourself that you experience when you're with that person. Yes. And you know, what are the two greatest emotions? Love, love and, and fear. fear. Mm -hmm. So when love is present, fear is absent. Yeah. Yet when fear is present, 
Love is absent. Mm. And the scripture says that men's hearts fail them. Fail them because of fear. Mm -hmm. So where's our focus? Mm -hmm. it, it is going to cost something mm -hmm. to be committed in a relationship, to share yourself. Well, the fear factor is if, if some people are afraid to say, I love you, because they're afraid you may not say it back or they may not receive it back at a level they feel is genuine. A lot of times couples don't say it to each other. They do love each other. They feel the love, but they're also afraid of the love. Some people are afraid of relationships because they don't think good about themselves. So they won't enter a relationship and be authentic. They've got all these, if you're always in and out of relationships, you can't stay in one, ask yourself why. Why is it that I, because we self-sabotage relationships, you can do that. You can, because of your fears. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid of it? Write it down. You're afraid of your body, you're afraid of your emotions, you're afraid of being hurt. And, uh, and that's a, those are all legitimate fears. Nobody wants to be hurt, nobody wants to be rejected. And sometimes right in, the, in a love relationship, in a marriage, I know there have been times when I, when we're tense and arguing about something, when I really sh could just hug you and say it's going to be all right, and baby, just, just calm. I won't do that even when I know she needs it and I need it, but I'm either too upset about it or I'm afraid she's not going to receive it. And I can honestly say in the 20 years we've been married, never once have I reached out to Gina physically to pull her close to me, even in tense times that she didn't just sort of melt in my arms. Because she melts in my arms anyway, but she melts more when she's cold. See, when she's frozen, and I wrap, the, wrap those arms. Because sometimes a lady, uh, a woman will say, and remember the, the Greek word for uterus is the word hystera, where we get the English word hysteria, or hysterical, or hysterectomy. That's the Greek meaning. The hysteria that sometimes females go through, men do too, but we've been taught to, you know, express ourselves differently or to suppress it. But sometimes we have to understand that the woman has a baby, carries babies, there's emotions, there's, there's, there's a physicality, a physical attachment to being a woman that is burdensome and most of us men will never understand that. I had to keep that in mind in dealing with my wife lovingly, dealing with you with sensitivity when I'm insensitive and you know when that is and I know. I usually know when I'm insensitive. Some, good some, to know. Yeah, it's so good. You can choose. Right, and do you do you know when you're insensitive? <laughs> I thought I'd add that because. <laughs> well, you know, it's really great you say that because when I can take responsibility to what I'm committed to causing in my relationship with you, then I can be about that. Say that again. When you can take responsibility. When I can take responsibility <clears throat> for what experience that I'm committed to causing in our relationship, mm. then I can be really keen about those times when I'm being insensitive. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to point it out to me. Mm -hmm. I know when I'm not creating what I'm committed to, the love, the sensitivity, you know, to be in tune with you. I know when those times are. And so I'm really working to develop an awareness that this is not what I'm wanting to create. Mm. It's giving me results I'm not committed to. Mm. So then I can take responsibility and acknowledge that sure. authentically, you know, with my kids, you know, with majesty. When they are reflecting something other than what I'm wanting to cause, mm. I can blame them or I can take responsibility. This is not what I'm wanting to create mm. now. So let me acknowledge that. You know. Do you usually blame them or take responsibility? Well, I've done both. Oh, but I'm yes, you, learning you certainly both certainly can. that I have the power <laughs> to take responsibility and not criticize or judge and give my power away mm -hmm. to make it about you or make it about them. Sure. And sometimes we're not um, just insensitive. We can be too sensitive, oversensitive about stuff, you know, paranoid about our fears and our hurts. And, and what, what are the, some of the things, and let's just be honest, what, what hurts you? Um, what are some of the things that, that you fear most, babe, in, 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 a, in a relationship or in our relationship or any relationship you've ever been involved in? Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, initially when I married you and the newness of a relationship and our life was so Big Busy, and fast. And big just... and fast. And 
I gave a lot of my power away, making it about the situation, the demand of our lives, the demand of our time. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've recognized my ability to create it just like I want it. Mm -hmm. You know, to vibrate with whatever is unfolding, learn to be with it. It's mm -hmm. like stress. If it's out there and you can't deal with it, I can't do anything else about it. I'm learning to vibe with it, mm -hmm. learn to love it, and create it such that it doesn't have me. Well, you know, some of you don't know that um, I met Gina May 20th, um, May 20th and was engaged to her 10 days later, married to her three months later, September 3rd. Julian was born about 10 months later. We married September 9th and he was born July 9th, uh, September 3rd. He was born or uh, July, July 9th. So it wasn't even a year. I mean, we didn't really know each other. Our, my life was fast paced. I was taking her with me all over the country, really all over the world. And uh, she was learning the first, now she's from a Catholic background. So she wasn't, she wasn't as if she sat in a normal church with, with a pastor in the first lady and observed all that. She didn't. So I didn't marry somebody in my tradition. I married somebody out of my tradition and she was on the job training and these expectations were high. We barely knew each other and we've lasted 20 years. And we blasted 20 years. <laughs> so it ain't you know, <laughs> When I think about it, and you know, I can say this, and I don't know that I've ever actually said this to you, but we met so quickly. And I was not in love with you when I married you. You, you thought you were? Well, I was in love, love with love. With what was possible between us. I had just met you. Yeah. I knew the potential was amazing. You had a tremendous commitment to transform humanity. That was my stand. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, together, what we, can we create? And we actually said that we were in married on purpose and for purpose. And that when, when the love didn't feel like it was there, purpose would remain. Remember we made that covenant back because we knew I had never been in love. I had loved women, certain women before, but I had never been in love with any woman that I know of. I, there were times when I thought it was like in college and around that time, girls I was infatuated with. But I knew there's something about the attraction I had to you that was different from other attractions I'd had. And some very viable and real and meaningful and sincere relationship I had with the other ladies. But for some reason, at 40 years old, I knew I was supposed to be married. I knew you were going to come in my life. And I was actually thrilled that I didn't know you that well, that you fascinated me, and that you didn't know me that well. I mean, well, I met her in the, in the airport, and that she was introduced to me by George and Pam Vanette. And she uh, just said, how do you do, and walked away. Yeah, but I loved who you were for others. I loved your compassion for people. Mm -hmm. I knew how much you loved your mother. I discovered it in those short months that we were together. Mm -hmm. You were a man of great sensitivity, great compassion, and your love for God really drew me to you. Mm -hmm. And I had a commitment to be what you had never had or experienced. I, I was attracted to her, and I don't know all the reasons why, a lot of it, of course, was spirit, but I, I changed my, I met her on Thursday. I preached two nights at the Abundant Life Church in, 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 in Atlanta, um, New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I think that was the name of it. And then I, I changed my departure that Saturday to later on that afternoon so she, I could spend the morning with her. She gave us a little tour of, of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And she was so bubbly and so bright and so cute and fine and all that stuff. And I studied it. I just wanted to see her outside the church setting and I just, I was mesmerized by, she was telling us, we, we took a boat across the bay. The ferry. The ferry and we went downtown. downtown. And, and she knew New Orleans quite well, and I just was uh, very, very fascinated about that little bubbly aspect. Then I called her that Monday, I yeah, think, you or Sunday night. So romantic. You really were. And it was the season of life that we were in. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking to be married. I was really, really content in my singleness. And, you know, oftentimes we think we need an object for our love. Mm -hmm. But when we can discover it within ourselves, I could love you because I had a love for me. Mm -hmm. Now, did it not cost something? 
you know, there was many opportunities in my relationship with you that I began discovering who I was with you. You know, what did that look like mm -hmm. to live with somebody in a day-to-day -day commitment? Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes, I mean, it's easier to blame what's not working outside of us, but it's also not very powerful. And then I had been single for 40 years, so I had to adjust to being, and it's not like we had a long engagement or long dating relationship or I, we knew each other from childhood and we had this history together, new family with the same school. None of that. We were strangers. Strangers in the night, exchanging glances. <laughs> and we sometimes literally were strangers in the night for months. I'm laying beside this gorgeous lady that I love and who was shortly there pregnant with my son and later our daughter, uh, Majesty. Uh, but we were still strangers. We were strangers off and on for years. Every once in a while, <laughs> you strange the date. So, <laughs> uh, but the Bible says be careful entertaining strangers for some have entertained angels or demons. I don't know. It just says angels. <laughs> Uh, you want to add a commentary to that? <laughs> wow, yeah, 20 years later. Yeah, it's amazing. A uh, road of discovery, mm -hmm. self-discovery, mm -hmm. self-discovery. But it takes a commitment because times are difficult. You know, what did it take to be alive today, to have kids? You know, I'm so proud of our kids and I really want to acknowledge you for your commitment because I know it was difficult at times. I was discovering myself inside of all that we were committed to and it was all done on stage. Yeah, before the world. And that is why I have such a passion for transformation because mm -hmm. without it, I, I, I owe it all to the work. There's no way we would be sitting here today. Well, I want to I want to get back to this pain thing uh, because we're so we run from pain. My leg aches sometime, or my arm aches, or you can have an eye ache, or a headache, or an ear ache, or you can bite your tongue. That doesn't mean you want to amputate it. You don't want to. Your heart aches. You don't want a heart transplant, or you don't want to lose the heart. What do you do with the pain? How do you manage the pain? First of all. Don't denounce it or deny it or demean it. Um, we have to learn how to value the pain and the pathos of love. Um, I get really hurt if I know that Gina's not happy with me and she gets hurt. Now we always say, um, as long as wife, what is it, wife is happy, everybody's happy, or mm -hmm. if mommy ain't happy, nobody's happy, or something like that, I forget the term. I don't even like it, but it's true. Uh, but I've had to, to accept the fact that there's something very cumbersome about love. And this is what you don't hear people talk about. We talk about the smooth things and all the... But nobody's going to flop around that. We lose marriages and relationships and the pleasure in the relationship because we do not know how to handle the, the pain. Uh, if Gina had decided because birthing our two children were too painful, we wouldn't have them, we wouldn't have them. Because I didn't feel the same pain. I remember when Julian was born, I flew all the way from San Jose, California to, to get there. He came three weeks early. So I had planned it out. I thought, I told God <laughs> what I was going to do and how to measure it out just right. He came up here three weeks early. So I had to literally charter a jet, a Lear jet to fly 20 years ago. He's 19, to fly all the way from San Jose, California, where we're in Azusa uh, meeting. Daryl Hines and Ernestine Reams, I remember, they kept the meeting, closed it out that Friday night. I hustled to Tulsa, got there at 1.30 and got there at 12.30 in the mor morning. Julian was born one hour later. Gina was all dressed up, looking like this. I mean, e I remember walking in, she had earrings on, her hair was done, makeup. And I said, I said, why, babe, why are you all dressed up? She said, because I knew you were coming. And I worked with her and we did, went through our breathing deals. But I also saw the pain. She did not want, she said, please, whatever, don't let them give me uh, Pitocin. Mm -hmm. She, I said, well, baby, it'll be so much easier. She, she, I don't know. What were you thinking? Well, because of the effects that it has on Children. the baby, yeah. I didn't want that transferred to Julian. Well, she, she heard, but I mean, she didn't scream and curse and froth like some, some women having babies do, but it was painful and I couldn't take the pain. I was rubbing her feet and massaging her and kissing her and holding her. And I don't know. It took about how much labor? Not, not too long. I, I don't exactly remember, but your presence made the difference because you can't have a baby. 
you can't stretch to that expanse without pain. Yeah. It's, you know, in life. Birthing. That's a good point. The birthing. Yes. It just comes as a package deal. Mm -hmm. In life, there is pain. Most of it happens, though, and we revisit it because it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's necessary. Yeah. And it's a signal emotion. Something needs to be attended to. Yeah. And we demonize it, and we're paranoid about it, and some people's threshold of pain is a lot lower. Uh, women tend to have a higher threshold. Actually, <clears throat> more boys are born than females, than girls, but women or females have, an, have a constitution in them of survival. And uh, that's why there are more women on the planet than there are men. Men usually die earlier. Uh, they, they don't have the resilience. We're stronger. We can lift burdens heavier, heavier burdens, but we can't lift them as long. So women often uh, live seven to ten years longer than, than men. Well, if you're in a relationship that's painful, don't ask yourself, why am I hurting? But where did the pain come from? Because most of our pain is historical. Some of the pain I experience in this relationship is something that triggers of, out of my childhood or my or Gina's childhood. It, 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 it can be triggered by something present, but its roots are in something in the past. For where there's fruit, there's root. So don't say why am I hurting, but say where did this pain originate and why is it so pertinent? Yeah. Don't denounce so it necessary. and don't deny it. Investigate it. Uh, before you react, sometimes I have to tell myself, okay, before you react to that pain, maybe it's not Gina, that she may have triggered it, but go back to where it originated. I've gotten a lot of personal, I call that personal therapy. I've ministered to myself privately by realizing that I allowed, that's as you say, give, gave my power away to that particular moment because she might have ignored me or she spoke what I would call short. This my my Lolly said, don't cut me all short. Uh, it wasn't really Gina. It's something that I have not dealt with in my past. That's why we say anger is a signal emotion. It signals some emotion or commotion or even a devotion in your life somewhere with which you, about which you've not, or with which you've not dealt. It's a perception. It's yeah. what you make up about it anyway. Good. Talk about the making up. The yeah, it's, it's what we make up the about stories. what happened, the story about it. Mm. Yeah, I could have incompletions with my dad. My dad may have been, you know, frustrated with me at a moment that terribly disappointed me that I would have disappointed him. And, and I that, reminded you of it. And you could have reminded. So all about perception. A lot of our pain is just historic. Uh, talk a little bit about, and I love this whole concept of, 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 of making a story up. Because we do that with our, with our wild imaginations. I can make up a story about Gina that's completely untrue about her, what she thinks about me. I create a story through my imagination and my perceptions that may be totally unfair to her because I'm creating this story and I'm living in that story and it's not even real, except that I make it so. Absolutely. Well, it's like saying that I was sexually abused. Was I or was I just inappropriately touched? Mm -hmm. It's what I make up about it. Ah, over the years, you can, you can actually embellish and fantasize over something that wasn't really as severe as you make it. Absolutely. Good point. Inappropriate touch. Mm. Is it happening now? No, it isn't. Not with me. No, it's always appropriate. <laughs> We're going to be having a week, but me. <laughs> Glad that there is touch. <laughs> <laughs> Any touch. <laughs> but it's just about oftentimes what we make up about a situation, mm -hmm. you know, or how something was said. If I responded to you in a quick way, if I was rushing or something and, you know, raised my voice or responded quickly or harshly, that could make you feel... Like a little boy. You know, sometimes, you know, Gina's strong. My wife, everybody doesn't have, usually opposites attract. And then they attack. Sometimes years down the road. But she's strong. She's a strong. My mother was strong. My grandmother was strong. My godmother was strong. My aunts, all my aunts are very strong women. All four of my sisters are strong and forceful. My daughter is strong and forceful. So I've been around all these forceful women all my life. 
and I, I need counseling. And what do you make I up about therapy. that? <laughs> yes, I, I remember when, when Julian was like six or seven years old, I'd leave town, and he'd get on the phone and call me uh, on the phone when he was really like six or seven. He said, Daddy, where are you? And I said, I'm in Sacramento. God, you leave me here with these two crazy <laughs> women. He was talking about his sister, Majesty, who was like two years younger than him and his mother. And I, he got it. And I had to say, well, I'll be back, son, and to he protect heard, you. Did he hear you say that? He could discern my spirit whether he heard it or not. <laughs> but these are strong women. Now, a man has to learn in to develop his coping mechanisms, not his resistance. When you resist the strength of your wife or woman or partner, if you're, you're gay, when you resist that, you resent it, you resist it, you create tension in the relationship that can be destructive. Learn how to manage the pain and manage or negotiate or, or navigate through what you perceive to be hurtful. And we usually want to say, you don't realize you're hurting me and that's going to have to stop because you, if I just slapped you, well, you would re retaliate. If you just slapped me, would you have any, you better not because I would retaliate. I'm so glad we don't resort to that. Oh, behavior. that would be horrible. But when people do resort to physical violence, it's reaction. Sometimes when we're, when we're arguing or, or making a point, I'm not listening to what you're saying. I'm planning my response. A lot of times in a, in, a, in a discussion or an argument, you don't listen to what the, the person is saying. You're just planning your response. You're already figuring out how you're going to respond to something or re use this reaction to something that might have been said 20 minutes ago or 20 days ago or 20 years ago. And you're bringing it into this present. And we've done that I, many times. I, sometimes I'm not listening to you at all. I'm listening to all those voices that I carry in my head that make commentary on what you say. I call it Great passengers. Point. Great point. Very often I don't hear anything. I'm hearing all these, my mother, my godmother, my grandmother, my school teacher, some counselor, some preacher, some sermon, even a scripture. I'm listening to all that, other people's opinions, and I miss everything she said. I feel what she says, but I don't hear what she says. And I've learned how to navigate through that. I'm very good at listening when I want to listen, but sometimes <laughs> I just don't want to listen. <laughs> I, I love your honesty. And I'm just, you can, you can tell when I draw oh, the I wall. Can. I'll just put a wall up and uh, just dismiss her. And that's very hurtful to her. It's good punishment, though. It's bigger. Anyway, <laughs> she doesn't do that that often. I mean, she's in your face and very honest and very direct. And we, so I have, after 20 years now, I learned how Gina manages her pain. Sometimes she responds, sometimes she reacts. Same with me, right? Can you, can you, can you uh, describe the difference of what you would consider a reaction on my part or a response to uh, compare the, a reaction to a response? Absolutely. And there are times I recall I've asked you, so are you talking about what I just <clears throat> asked you or is that a conversation that's incomplete <clears throat> with your mother? Sure. I can remember times which is not always welcomed by you, but when we can get present. Are you talking to your mother? <laughs> I, I, sure, so I ain't your mom and I always say, I ain't your daddy. You know. Well, you know, it's just But those rich. are valid those are yeah. valid questions, yeah. Yeah, it's rich. And um, thank you. I would not be the woman I am today if I didn't have the, rig have the rigor that you have brought into this relationship. Well, I'm also fascinated, excuse me, for, I'm not bored and you're not keeping me awake, but it's late at night. Um, I did not realize how much you are like my mother. You even look like her. They're, they're, you, you know, you used to wear the French roll and they're just... I look at pictures sometimes, and you, we, we were looking at something the other day, and you last even night. thought you looked like my mom. Was it last night? Yeah. Um, I didn't. That was not in my mind when I married her. I wasn't looking for my mother, I don't think. But, of course, there are certain characteristics in my mother that I do look for and expect in a, in, in a woman. Because you, most boys particularly, but children in general, you have a huge and high respect from your, your mother. She's the goddess from the beginning. And you spend mo more of your time pleasing her and answering her and trying to uh, live up to what her expectations are. We carry that into our lives. So very often, Gina does remind me, her reactions will be just what my mother's would have been. And sometimes that's 
uh, painful and I felt like a little boy and you know I say to ladies if you treat your your if, if a man acts like a child your wife will treat you like she's your mother or sometimes if the wife insists on treating on acting like a mother the kid the husband will act like a child and act out like a child same with husband and wife if you're going to be daddy to her all the time she might be a, a little baby a little whining child and I've seen both in us. You know, sometimes I'm a little boy reacting to in fear or intimidation to my wife as if she's my mother or vice versa. And I'm not saying either of our mothers are bad women. They were wonderful, wonderful. Gina's mother's transition. Mine is still here. She's 84 and I absolutely adore her. I don't know how not to. But she could be just as worse as she, <laughs> <laughs> she and daddy. But they're older people. But I don't, that's the only mother I know. And I absolutely adore her and respect her and I am a lot of what I am because of her and I think I in consciously in consciousness created you absolutely I brought you into my life absolutely I I'm really clear that we were a match for each other's frequency the vibration mm -hmm. that's why it seemed so right that we could come together in the union of marriage mm -hmm. yeah. I had just come off of a 21 day fast mm -hmm. and created you in my life and you were ready for change and I just came along and blew you completely off your feet swept you bam and uh, she's been <laughs> sweeping me ever since <laughs> with a broom <laughs> it's, it's been beautiful it's been, we've been all over the world yeah the experiences we were looking at the photo albums and we were riding the kids through some Disney park once you had a stroller and I had the stroller. Oh. The memories have just been so. We've great. taken them to Disney World. It took Julian went to Disneyland. Madge has never been there, but they've all both been to Disney World several times. Universal Studios, Epcot, San Diego, the zoos, um, Sea World. We've jet skied and 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 um, uh, Paris. Well, did you perish that with me? I almost almost I did not but you know our life would not be what it is had we not lasted to see this beautiful creation yes you know our 19 year old lives at home with us and he'd like not to be but mm -hmm. he is and we love that yeah we we'd wanted to stay as here. long as we could keep him <laughs> we'd keep him here forever if we could some kids want to get out of their house so badly they they go into deep deep debt trying to to live of course, he lives close to Columbia where he went to school for a semester and will be taking more classes there. But uh, Majesty is coming out of high school and in a year or two, our house could be free of kids. I mean, there would be nobody here. And uh, sometimes, and that's another thing, to having children in your life, you got to let them go, you know, um, because some people are so tense in the home with the children in their teenage years. And so when, when they get 18 or 19, or 20, they can't wait to get away. They are going to go out of your life. So while they're there, we don't want to make our kids feel, we have to confront our children on things we have. We always will, even when they're gone, but not in a way that makes them distance themselves from us because you only do it for love. You don't want them to dislike you. And I know a lot of families that you, you fuss and cuss at the kids all the time. And then you wake up one day and they're gone. And you wonder why they don't come or call. Well, you basically made their lives hell the whole time. I know you meant well. And the pathos of that love you have from them, for them is intensified when they're gone and they're not calling and they're not coming around and they don't want to call. They don't want to come around. I'd rather my children not have time or take time than to, to call me than to actually not want to call or not want to come around. You know, that's what I'm creating now because in a few years it'll be just me and Gina growing old together. <laughs> and I'm, I don't want to grow along. I'm, I'm watching her mature. She has her, she ain't wearing much. She's got glasses on here. She looks, I think she looks fantastic in them. Put them on, baby. Let the people see how classy they are. I'm caught up with you now. And this is, this is one of about 16 pairs she has. <laughs> she keeps changing them. Some of them are bifocals. She might even eat trifocals. But... Uh, we're growing old together and I cherish even the painful moments. I cherish it because it's part of who we are. We're not unaffected by what we've gone through as people, as human beings and as a married couple and parents, but we were not infected or defected by it. In fact, we're getting better. Don't you think, sweetheart? Absolutely. We're healthier because of it. Mm -hmm. Emotionally what, and physically. Yeah. And that's what it takes, being authentic to have the difficult conversations, to say the things that need to be said, to risk 
saying those things. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, you know, coming on board, I had a lot of people giving me feedback about who, what I needed to be, who I needed to be, what I needed to wear as a first lady. And so it was a struggle, you know, balancing being true to myself mm -hmm. and uh, growing and expanding and taking it on to whom much is given, much is required. So I want to say thank you to you for your commitment to our love, for your commitment to our family, for who you are as a provider. Thank you. Your commitment to your spiritual practice and the development of the expansion of who you are as a God in the universe. Thank you. Ooh, let me take, keep going. On. Well, I need to take notes of all these <laughs> wonderful things she's saying about me so I don't forget them. I really appreciate you. Well, we, don't, we want you to remember this. <clears throat> Locate the pain. Process the pain and then progress beyond Ooh, it. Yes. Move forward. Don't create stories that, that, and if you do, you can uncreate them or recreate another one. Ask yourself what you're going to do, whether it's inevitable, and pain is inevitable. Misery is a choice. The pain comes, it's unavoidable. You choose whether or not you're going to be miserable. There have been many times in our relationship over the 20 years when I had, made a, had to make a choice to stop protesting and contesting, resisting and resenting marriage or Gina as my wife and accept that this, and I remember when we were in Hawaii, we checked into a hotel in... Uh, the Waldorf Astoria? During our honeymoon and the lady said, um, we told her we had just gotten married and, and she said, well, just make a decision between you now that divorce is never a choice. It's never one of the choices. For some reason, that stuck with me. You know, because it's very easy to divorce today. I'm not denouncing divorcees. Uh, because some marriages end because they, they, they die naturally and some by disease and other reasons. Um, we've never been diseased. We've had a sick marriage, but we've never had a diseased uh, marriage in the sense that we have organic disease. There's been dis-ease, yes, but we treat it. But we had to, instead of reacting to the pain, respond to it, interview it. Before I put the blame on Gina, I have to interview my own pain, okay? Say, okay, what are you, what are you saying to me? Where, where, where did you come from? Because I'm not gonna blame Gina for it. Let's, let's have this conversation between us, me and pain. Have you ever yeah. had one? Well, and when you're committed to purpose, Pain does not have to pro prevail. Prevail. Yeah. It doesn't have to, because it's going to be there. What is there to discover in it? What can you learn from it and move through it? It's just a fact of life. Yeah, pain is part of purpose, not prevailing over it. It is. It doesn't preempt purpose. It is part of it. That's the point we're trying to make. Is that pain is goal? It's it's par, par for the course. So so learn how to manage it in a loving way. Whether that's having a baby, or eating something that disagrees with your body, uh, or doing workout, you know, exercise with, with no pain, no... No gain. And when you're birthing, that's part of the process. Yeah. So if you're expanding, if you're stepping out of your comfort zone, if you're stretching beyond what's familiar, you're going to feel some pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. you're gonna, we have to grow up around that. Mm -hmm. But don't be overpowered by the pain. Now, I say love is, is powerful and passionate and prophetic and pathetic. And it's, it's, it can be an imposition. It can be encumbering. That's all part of it. Not just er erotic love or eros love, but the, even the Christian doctrine of the agape or agapao, which is much love, the love of God toward us, the, the pain that it's caused if you believe in Calvary and the agony of the cross, or what we call the path, the passion of Christ, that means the suffering of Christ. So there's some suffering in love. There's some suffering in, I remember when Madge was her 16th birthday and, and it was a stress, stretch on us to give her the kind of party that her other friends were having. And that's money has never been a big issue with us over the years, but we, we've been over the last 10 years, we've been stretched in so many different ways. There are times when the money's really good and there's some times when it's really not. I've always tried to go out of my way to make sure my family doesn't feel what I feel in the lack. Um, Jim, turn that down just a little bit because I hear that music. Um, I don't want the, the people to hit. Uh, <clears throat> I, I try to protect them from some of it, but not, I can't. I also want them to feel 
the fact that that you have to be responsible with money. But I remember the pain when Mad Mad said, "Daddy, I want a sweet 16 birthday party, and we needed to spend that money on some other critical issues." But I would lose sleep thinking, "Oh gosh, this is hurting. This is weird. I'm not supposed to hurt this bad." I love my daughter, and you know, Julie didn't require all that. He he does he he's required a lot less than the Majesty, the daughter. She's been a little bit more high maintenance because she has her little frills and her little clothes, and she's very she's impossible to to shop for and sometimes impossible to shop with uh, I just let her go or let her mother do it because her mother has the patience that I don't I said get that get that get that and let's go she likes to you can you can't hardly please her and I remember why is this hurting why is this feeling so awkward this love I have for my daughter and she had a great and I wasn't even in town but you, you guys had a great yeah 16. so let's look at that what did you make that mean well it made, made me it was my ego and my pri pride and my wanting to be her hero and her provider and to make sure that she at 16 would not remember anything but a great six sweet none of my sisters had that there were four of my in my family 16 that was for white folks that was the way we were thinking back in the 60s black folks don't have no sweet 16 we don't have no sweet nothing but we've changed over the years and our culture has evolved um but it was important to my daughter because all her friends and and and, and she goes to a fine arts a um, fine arts school here those girls got all dressed up like a prom. It was great. And they had major parties and had their friends over. So she was up on the rooftop where we lived at that time and she had a great party. Her brother was there and did the uh, DJing. DJing and they videotaped and it was wonderful. But I got to thinking this party, even though I wasn't there, may be more or at least as important to me than it, as it was for her. And it was because of the value you placed on it. You wanted your daughter to have a sweet 16 party. Right, right. And of course she did. But um, the, what if I couldn't, I thought of the, the hundreds and thousands of parents who simply can't get there for whatever reason. Uh, and the child who doesn't complain a lot but has to come home knowing that all her other friends had a sweet 16. I thought about that too. How many ch little girls don't even have a father at home to worry about them like that? And my heart went out to them. And of course, um, um, how many little girls don't feel worthy of it? And I remember when we were coming up, um, and because of the way we, there were six of us and you had, there were nine in your family. We didn't yeah. expect, I didn't have high expectations. Did anybody have a sweet 16 in your house? Do you know the first party that I had was the party that was thrown for me after I married you at the church? That was the first party I ever had in my life. Birthday party? Birthday party. Did you tell me that? I don't know that I ever did, but I'm recalling that right now. Wow. You, you okay, sweetheart? I'm sorry. <laughs> It's yeah. what we make up about it. Yeah, it's true. You know, all that suffering. You, you weren't whining about it, but not having one, but when you did, you appreciated it. I really did. It was mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Yeah. Have we had any since? <laughs> <laughs> well. She had a great one for me for my 60th uh, birthday last year right here at the at the uh, loft. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, great. I loved it. Well, are we through? Is there anything else to say? I love you. <laughs> I love you too, sweetheart. And... I love those of you who've joined us. Thank you for your commitment to life and recognize that your pain does not have to incapacitate you. You're gonna have those moments, but they're all a part of life. Learn to love them. Learn to discover what is the pain signaling and what needs to be addressed. And then create the life you love. Create the life that you have imagined. It's possible. And learn to um, love the, that's what I am at least, learning to love the process, uh, to embrace the process, to respect the process, and to honor it, whatever that is. I strongly believe that all things work together for good and that not only are we created beings, we are creative beings and we are creating beings yes. right now. That's all there is. You're always creating physically, whether that's urine or saliva or tears, your, your, the cells and, and the capillaries in, in, your, uh, in, in your blood systems are shifting constantly. You're constantly creating something, but you do so consciously. 
You do so, you do so in consciousness, but you need to do it consciously in consciousness. Not, and do it intentionally. Intentionally, And yes. deliberately, not accidentally. Choose what you want to create. Don't accept it by chance. Uh, so that, that puts the, the responsibility back into you and removes the victim consciousness. Choose to love. Choose to be loved. Choose to um, assume the responsibilities of love. If I'm going to have this gorgeous lady in my life, she lays beside me every night and she loves to snuggle. And uh, let's snuggle, let's snuggle. Sometimes that's uncomfortable because it might be hurt my little hips or shoulder or something like that. But I, I can actually put that pain away and just snuggle with her till she falls asleep and push her back over and go to sleep <laughs> myself. But we love snuggling. Sometimes our 17 year old daughter will get in there in, the, in bed with us and just snuggle. Judah might come and lay across the, the bed. We like it when our kids come around. We always, we've been snugglers all our lives. Uh, and but we still touch, and we 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 even conveniently inconvenience ourselves to be with the other. Sometimes I do have to put the computer away, the phone away, and just focus on her. She falls asleep pretty quickly, and I can get back to work. <laughs> but it's sometimes that you know, I have to deliberately do Thank that, you. and 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 deprive myself, uh, and at the same time enjoy her attention and enjoy giving her attention. She likes to be touched. All women like to be touched. Men do too, but we like to do the touching, uh, you know, because for various reasons. That's all part of the science and the, um, the uh, psychology of love and the psychology of intimacy and being one, right? Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, sweetheart. Happy Valentine's to you. And uh, we are going to be in, in New York this weekend on Valentine's Day, New York City for the weekend. And um, we're going out um, to, uh, to California and then uh, to New York and then back home the next week. So we're, we're traveling together more, doing more things together. If you'd like for us to come, sometimes your area, uh, or you want to know when we're going to be in your area, just stay, stay tuned to the site here. We usually uh, post the dates where we're speaking. Gina's starting her life coaching uh, ministry and it's really a business because people will actually pay for, for her to coach them for an hour and she's excellent at it. Women or men, a lot of women flock around her so she's going to be doing some special training even this weekend in New York so I'm excited for her on that. She's going to get her site up, fit for life. Tell them what that means. Physiologically healed, internally transformed. Fit for life, isn't that great? So uh, we're, we're ready to move into the next level of our expression and our experience and it's good, it's all good, because it's all God. We love you, thanks for your time. And make sure if you want to donate something this week, go push that little donate button. We want to continue to do more of this. I know many of you want Gina more involved sometimes. She'll actually do the entire program herself. This goes all over the world and we need all the support we can get because we're about to expand. So just push the little donate button, whether that's $10 or $20 or $200 or $500 or $100 one time. Some of, you, some of you do it every month and thank you so much for your monthly gifts. We need that, we expect it, and we, um, we appreciate it very, very much. We love you, thank you for your time, thank you for your consciousness. Happy Valentine's Day.